sorry for the delay. Um, I'm just going to uh, restart. Okay, good. Um, um, we have Gabarita Day, who is a researcher at Microsoft Research, where he is a principal researcher. His background is in robotics, uh, uh, planning, reinforcement learning, and imitation learning. Uh, today, he'll be talking about his work in neuroarchitecture search. Take it away, Day. Thank you very much, uh, Isong. I'm very excited, and I think this is my first time uh, uh, teaching a class at, uh, at Caltech, and it's remote, so um, I wish I could be there in person, so, but uh, we will have fun, try to have fun either way. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so what, what we are going to talk about today is this very extremely hot topic, and you will see why, of neural architecture search, and we will talk uh, in this one and a half hours approximately, I'll try to cover state of the art, what's, what's really going on, the landscape um, and trends um, and, and, and what are open problems. At, at least at the end of this class, what I'm hoping you will walk away with is what's really going on there, um, what's uh, useful, what's hype, what's, uh, what are areas in which uh, advances in combinatorial optimization, planning, uh, estimation, how do we do principled estimation, all these things are uh, things that you have been seeing uh, and I've been looking at the class uh, topics and, and what Isong told me, uh, these things will uh, all apply here, right? So uh, things that you have probably been learning in other classes will help you come up with better algorithms even for neural architecture search. And uh, so uh, I got into this by chance, right? So this was about two years ago. I was visiting MSI New York and, and John Langford uh, and we had some meeting and we were talking about some paper of his and then I brought up the dense net paper and then John was looking at this and he said, I have no idea how I will come up with this, right? And in fact, like, you know, everybody in the room was like, oh, we have, nobody here has clues on why this number is 14, why this is 56, why should we have the input number layer have size 256 by 256, and, and why this particular configuration, like, and, and uh, what do I need to know in order to come up with good configurations, right? And, and, and this, this is probably something, meaning if you have taken um, and I'm sure everybody has been exposed at least cursorily to deep learning. It's hard not to nowadays. And you have probably seen that, hey, uh, I got a new data set and with, with, let's say it's a classification or regression task to keep it simple, how, wh wh what should I try, right? And, and this is a little bit of a dark arts. Uh, you can go and download whatever is the flavor of the month. Uh, I attended some iClear paper. They showed this cool architecture. Maybe I should go and uh, uh, just code it up in PyTorch or TensorFlow and see how it does. Well, or most commonly what happens is, uh, oh, this is a vision data set. I know ResNet, DenseNet, uh, and, and nowadays EfficientNet, these kinds of things are useful. So maybe we should start with that and then see what happens, right? But what happens if I give you a data set which is completely new, right? And let's say it's not vision, it's not text, right? So there's, there's a, not a lot of like what we would call as communal architecture search happening on it, right? So there's a not, not a lot of tribal knowledge in the community on what kind of architectures and attention and, and layers, etc., uh, work for this particular um, kind of data, right? Um, what if I give you a hybrid of structured, unstructured data, um, uh, discrete data sets with missing labels and, and then in a completely new domain, very funky loss function. So you might be like, I have no clue where to start, right? And also, uh, in, and, and to, uh, the, the, what, what really frustrates me, at least for, uh, in deep learning, is that there's so many things which are dark arts as, as opposed to like, you know, science, right? And, and we are all working very hard in the community to, to bring uh, better um, understanding, right? And, and, uh, and if you go to any iClear or ICML NeurIPS, you just see this in the paper, right? So um, yeah, so to, just to summarize, our motivation for doing neural architecture search is let uh, computer algorithms do this process, right? Instead of uh, looking for a human, uh, so-called human expert to come and sit at the computer and, and mess with uh, like, you know, layers and architectures, send them to your cluster and, and then figure out uh, what uh, works best, right? And, and let's get this trial and error. You know, these kinds of things, this kind of search 
uh, given the theme of the class by now, uh, is, is, is very good for computers to do, right? Wouldn't it be great if computers would do it instead, and, uh, instead of us manually doing it? Um, and uh, and uh, a more practical uh, motivation is that uh, I, I also work in, in industry. I'm in an industrial research setting. And, and micro, any, anybody in, in any Microsoft product group, if you were to ask, even outside Microsoft research, they will tell you that there's a massive talent shortage. And, and they, even today, they cannot uh, like, you know, hire people fast enough for the particular like, you know, um, applications they have. Right? So, and everybody wants to hire, and everybody is, is struggling right, uh, to find good talent. Um, so uh, in, the, in the beginning, so what we are going to do is we are going to do a very brief uh, literature overview, right? And so, and, and before we even go into the literature overview, we will uh, just think about if, wh what would it take to uh, do neural architecture search, right? Uh, let's say you have like, you know, very, all you need for at, le at least this lecture is to have just the basics of deep learning, right? You, you need to know, I'm going to assume that you know backdrop, uh, you know how to train, let's say, some uh, very simple neural uh, network on, let's say, MNIST uh, or, or equivalent small data set, and you have, you have some exp uh, exposure to that, right? So, so uh, uh, and you have some exposure to search algorithms. So th these are the, basically the two ingredients you need. So let's let's just do a thought experiment. I don't know how this will work in the interface here, uh, but uh, let's say how. Let's just imagine, right? Like you know, I come to you and say, design an algorithm which will find a good architecture on this data set to minimize cross entropy loss, right? And then let's take MNIST as an example. Um, what is the naivest, dumbest algorithm that you can probably code up in 20 minutes uh, look like? Right, um, uh, Isang, I don't know if you can ask questions or make it interactive through Zoom Any, uh, this way. Anyone want to raise their hands and uh, or or give an answer in chat? Everyone's shy. <laughs> okay, no worries. So, okay, let me let me give you an answer. I'm sure you have already thought about it. Most of you in your head already. The the simplest thing is to just uh, define a search space, which is like, let's say, I'm going to uh, take the space of uh, very simple neural networks. I'm going to say, how many layers does, can this have? Let's fix that number as, oh, I, I don't think we need more than 100 layers. So it can be a neural network between uh, whose depth is at max 100. And let's say these are, we keep the search space very simple. We are all have only fully connected networks. So then the question becomes, uh, if uh, what, uh, how many neurons should each fully connected layer have, uh, and and how many of these should be there, which is the depth, right? And and let's say we will we keep it very simple. They're all uh, like you know ReLU and uh, uh, activation layers are ReLU and and with some um, convolution layer, right? And um, uh, the question then becomes. Uh, what, what's a good, nice search algorithm? And if if you are uh, thinking of the simplest, we'll start from the simplest, but probably most inefficient one is let's enumerate the search space, right? And uh, uh, let's say the search space admits uh, 200,000 different architectures. I'm going to, uh, my algorithm is to first uh, come up with all 200,000, send each of these 200,000 uh, architectures to a cluster, and I will just, uh, the results will come back after uh, training. I will put, train them on, uh, I will test each one on, let's say the validation set uh, I have held out. And then I'm going to uh, pick the argmax, right? So th this is a very simple and, and nice uh, algorithm. Uh, you can probably implement it in half a day, uh, but your problem is you will never get like, you know, uh, this is infeasible, right? Uh, because this is one of the situations where uh, uh, function evaluation is expensive, right? Uh, and I give you a very simple example. Now, if I give you ImageNet or CIFAR 100 or CIFAR 10, uh, where training takes typically around half a day to a day on a modern GPU, then, then this becomes even more infeasible, right? Like, and, and unless you are at Google or Microsoft or a big tech company, 
you probably don't have uh, a cluster of uh, 2000 GPUs lying around that you will use in this way. And, 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 and this is very inefficient, right? So uh, keeping this very naive but infeasible algorithm in mind, uh, we, we have at least enumerated what are the things we would need for getting a good search algorithm, right? So uh, the things that we would need are we need to define a search space. And, and there are uh, right now uh, two different kinds of search spaces floating around, and we will see examples of this. And, and in uh, NAS lingo, uh, they are called macro or micro, right? Uh, and, and the search space basically determines what are the space of all possible architectures that can be realized, right? Uh, a lot of human bias goes into this search space design, and we, we will talk about this in a bit. Then there comes a search strategy. What I described is the most naive search strategy one can think of, which is just enumerate everything, pick the uh, uh, argmax, right? And uh, obviously, we don't want to do this, so we need to come up with strategies that do not train all, let's say, 200,000 architectures and come up with good ones or, or hopefully the optimal one uh, by using as little GPU hours as possible, right? And uh, we could also have uh, uh, other uh, things, which is not just accuracy, which is important in the real world, uh, which is uh, how many parameters does your model use? How many, uh, what's your memory footprint? What's the latency of inference? So all, all these things uh, actually also matter. So it turns out that in the most general sense, it is a Pareto uh, search problem, right? So you are looking for things which are optimal given constraints on uh, given other factors, right? Uh, not just constraints, you could have constraint versions as well uh, on memory flops uh, and uh, latency. Right. So, uh, and then usually what happens in order to make, come up with a search strategy, you usually need to do a performance estimation strategy. So the performance estimation strategy is not really at the same bullet level as the search strategy. Uh, so it, you, you should think of it as a, it is part of the search strategy. So the, the question becomes, if I somehow train, uh, let's say I pick a point in my space of architectures and I train it, what, what information can I derive about architectures which are, let's say, similar to this, and, and, and how can I bound what performance they can get such that I do not really have to train them, right? Like, you know, so for example, if you sample something and it turns out, hey, this was really bad, and uh, as compared to uh, other things I have tried, so maybe it's not that unreasonable to think that architectures which are similar to this uh, bad sample uh, I, I will tend not to do well as well, right? So if you, if you make these kinds of assumptions, you can get away with uh, not having to train everything, right? And, but how you do this, how you do this in a consistent manner is important, right? And, and we will see examples of uh, this uh, as, as we move along. So, uh, okay, so now let's make uh, the, this lingo of macro versus micro concrete. So uh, most of the, uh, literature, like, you know, about 90, 95% of papers coming out, they mostly deal with this thing called microarchitecture search or cell search. That's the other name for it. So the idea is this, we are going to take a bunch of uh, cells. So, so for example, this is a cell, this is a cell, um, uh, assuming you can see my cursor. Um, so uh, these are all cells. And in, we are also going to, things we are going to do is we are going to keep the design of these cells constant, and we are going. And if we want, we are only going to search for what should be the design of the cell. And once we come up with the design of the cell, we are going to just stack a bunch of these cells together to create a larger uh, network. And if I want a smaller network, I, I stack less of these cells together. So a very a popular way is to use a ResNet backbone. Uh, so where every cell is connected to every other cell in, in uh, behind it, uh, and uh, you just and you hold the design of all cells constant. Uh, so what this allows you to do is uh, re reduce the search space quite a bit, right? So if you imagine, like you know, instead of now searching for in the space of all general possible architectures of depth hundred, I'm uh, I'm going to search for all possible cells and in that particular cell, once I have that particular cell, I am going to just stack 100 of them up in order to create 100 layer architecture or 50 of them up. So, um, 
so so that's uh, cell search uh, cell architecture space um, and, and this also what what happens is people have injected and we will see examples of this later on uh, so much domain knowledge into this backbone that it turns out in many cases that it doesn't really matter how you design the cell because the ResNet style backbone turns out to be really good already. And, uh, and, and this is a point of uh, debate on how do we move away from uh, injecting so much human domain knowledge which biases the search and leaves performance on the table. Uh, and, and we will come back to that. So obviously, so okay, now this is the easier one to explain. This is, a, uh, this is called macro. You will find far fewer papers on this, but now, uh, but in the last, let's say, two months, it has uh, resurged, and which is good news. And this is obviously what you would expect as when you think of architecture search. This is the most general search space, right? Like anything goes, any DAG, any computational DAG works, right? And uh, and but obviously the problem is this can be very hard to search because the the space is very big. It's, it's much bigger than the cell search space because where, where it's much smaller uh, because of the constraints we, we put in there. Um, okay, so I love to show this particular, so there are some brave souls. Um, I don't know how Zoom will handle this. Okay, uh, let me know, Isong, if you can see my browser. Uh, I cannot, I believe you've only shared your PowerPoint slides. Oh, okay, okay, I can uh, share. New share. I can share the browser. Okay. Okay, I got it. Okay, so uh, there's this very nice website. Uh, you can see this? Okay, so this is very nice website. Uh, and if you are interested this uh, in doing uh, architecture search as your research, then th this this should be handy. Um, this is this is maintained by Marius Lindor and Frank Hutter and, and the entire group uh, in Freiburg. So um, so what they do is they go they scour all possible conferences. I don't know how they do that. How anybody has any time at all, and, and put up all papers that they can find. Uh, on on this uh, particular website, right? And and I, and, and then my reason I'm, I'm trying to show you this is the following, right? So so okay, take a look at uh, the ones in bold are published at some peer reviewed conference. Ones in not bold are usually just on archive right now and and have not been peer reviewed, right? So what they just do everything. So look at the date. So right now this is 2020. Uh, we are in May 19th, so we, we are not even halfway through. And let's count the number of page downs. So one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. Okay, after seven page downs, we are reaching 2019. So let's look at 2019. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Okay, uh, so that was almost like, you know, 23, 24 page downs. I haven't lost uh, track, right? And, and that was just 2019 in, in, in neural architecture search. Uh, sorry, 20, 20, uh, 2019, and now we are reaching 2018, um, 2017. And then here, here's a very interesting phenomenon. You will see this paper. So, so look at this screen. From 2016, 17, we have some, uh, uh, and then suddenly after 2015, we are all, there's one or two in 2008, 2009, and then we are all the way back to 1999, then 94, then 89, okay? So, in, so we basically went back a decade in one page down, uh, whereas now we can't even go down after 20 pages down from so just barely 2019, right? So this is just showing you like the, the dy by dx of NAS as a, as a field, right? Um, uh, so then the question is like, uh, are, you, are you supposed to go and read all these papers in this, on this? No, you should not, just like with any research topic, you don't need to, neither should you be spending your time reading every paper that gets published, because as is usual, there, there's a few key ideas and constructs, and, 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 mo and most of the papers will revolve around that, and, and many of them will also be application specific. So let me switch back. Um, Okay, and uh, okay. 
Perfect. So, uh, and I would also recommend this like, you know, survey article. So if you are after the class, if your interest gets picked, um, and, and this gets continuously updated, even though it's like got initially published in 2018, uh, they, they keep updating it. And I think it just got updated a month or two ago as well. So, and, and it's an excellent survey for you to give a deeper uh, introduction. So uh, as you had seen, uh, this was actually the paper on that list, uh, which which actually I credit for uh, restarting the uh, interest in architecture search. So around 2016, there was this paper by Quackley and Baradzoff and Quackley uh, that uh, from uh, Google research uh, with, with, with the use reinforcement learning to do neural architecture search. And I'm going to assume that you have at least seen, let's say policy gradient methods, but if you don't, I will give you a very quick intuitive explanation. So you don't really need to know what policy gradient or model free RL means right now. Um, so here's the entire method in actually this figure that I have stolen from their that paper. Uh, we are going to use a controller and uh, the, which is going to be a recursive neural network. And what this controller does is when it unrolls, it samples parameters of a neural network architecture, right? So when it unrolls, it will say the first unroll, it will predict the number of layers I should have. Then the second unroll, it might predict what is the layer type of layer one uh, of like, let's say K layers. And second one, third one should be what will be the layer type of layer two, so on and so forth. Right, and it may also predict some hyperparameters which are uh, layer specific. That, oh, if I pre if I predicted that the first layer should be a convolutional layer, then the second unroll will say the number we will interpret. It will the second unroll's uh, prediction we will interpret, let's say, as the stride. Right, like should it be a two a two stride of two stride of one, so on and so forth. Right. So when the controller unrolls for some steps, it uh, the, the resulting sequence of numbers encodes an architecture design. So the so when I sample from the controller, which, which basically means I, I give the controller, uh, make the controller output, make a prediction. I take this architecture that pops out and I send it to my cluster. And if I'm at Google, I have thousands and thousands of GPUs. So uh, this is not a problem, right? So I, I go and I send it to my cluster and this, what we are calling as the child network is this architecture we sampled from the controller. It, it goes, it trains on let's say MNIST or CIFAR 10 or, or ImageNet and it gets some accuracy R, right? And, and which we are going to interpret as the reward. The higher the accuracy, the higher the reward R and this reward gets feed, fed back to the controller. Right, and uh, we we update the controller. Uh, if if the reward is high, then what uh, the update rule, which they are basically using the policy gradient uh, reinforce, as if you are familiar with that uh, you know, formula, and they are going to which 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 have, will have the effect of basically making the controller sample such uh, high accuracy architectures more and sample uh, less accurate. Uh, sample less the, the architectures which didn't have such high accuracies, right? So, so this is this is the a very like plug and play. We are going to take reinforce and we are going to um, uh, use a, a controller RNN uh, as our policy network, and then this is it, right? Uh, there's the uh, notice one thing. This is a one-step procedure um, that uh, uh, if, if you are familiar with reinforcement learning or sequential decision making. You, you will immediately notice that that this is one step uh, in the horizon is one right like controller output something we evaluate it evaluation is expensive because evaluation in, involves a training procedure of a neural network on a data set and the output is a, a scalar reward we don't need to take a sequence of actions uh, we just need to take uh, one action which is sample the architecture evaluate and return so uh, the, everybody in the when this paper came out uh, everybody in the RL and the deep learning community started scratching their heads as to why we should use policy gradients for uh, doing this uh, when like, you know, we, we, this is one step. And secondly, if you are familiar with policy gradients, it, there's also stochasticity involved. Um, so anywho, uh, but that's just what they chose to do. Right. Uh, and to give you a little, uh, yeah, so this is uh, an example of the controller unrolling. 
to sample the parameters which define an architecture. So it can be, I sampled uh, a convolutional layer, then I sample number of filters it should have, filter height, width, stride, so on and so forth, right? And, and, and as I unroll this, it, it just tells me uh, what the parameters are, and then I feed it to the controller network. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you results after, I, after we see this, uh, and you might be curious if you have not seen these kinds of uh, work before uh, on, on how well these things do, but we, I will show you this. Uh, let, let's go to get through this paper and then we will get back to that. So um, the big problem, uh, other than the, the naive use of reinforcement learning, and, and I always tell students, interns, is that RL should not be your first go-to problem the moment you encounter a problem because, uh, and especially policy gradients are model free because uh, it's, it's like using the most general hammer for uh, a particular uh, problem. And yes, the hammer will do something. It's a giant general hammer, but you are uh, not paying attention to the structure of the problem, uh, to the, of the solution, uh, sorry, the structure of the problem. And uh, yeah, and it turns out, and we will see later uh, in later papers, that this performs no better than random uh, sampling. And um, if you uh, are familiar with RL, I would very much recommend Ben Rex's tutorial uh, blog post uh, called An Outsider's Perspective on Reinforcement Learning, where he talks about these issues in great detail. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, the big problem with this, with the previous method, uh, other than the RL, was also that it was extremely expensive, right? So uh, remember, in, in neural architecture search, most of the time uh, is going uh, in uh, function evaluation, which is which is an entire deep learning training procedure. So if you have 10,000 GPUs and your company doesn't really care if you what you do with them. Or your university doesn't care, then then fine. Then go take the most inefficient algorithm you can think of and do it, right? Um, but uh, what if you actually cared about efficiency in uh, search procedures, right? And where you don't want to enumerate everything, you don't want to. You want to be more competitive than random search, uh, which uh, then um, one uh, thing people noticed is that hey, uh, what if I took I shared all the weights of all the architectures which are similar to each other, right? So, uh, and, and, and so they came up, so this was the second paper in the series. This is again from Quackley's group. Uh, they, uh, they achieved better results than the previous paper, the, the NAS via policy gradient paper. Uh, they, they got to 2.89, which is, which is pretty, uh, like, you know, uh, was, it was good at the time. Um, they achieved good results on 55 uh, perplexity on Pentry Bank, which is a very small toy language modeling tasks. And uh, before uh, the, uh, and you'll see the exact numbers, I think it was like 3,000 or 5,000 GPU hours for the policy gradient method. Here, uh, they still use policy gradients and the RNN controller and everything, but they were able to get uh, search time to less than 16 hours, right? this is looking a much more interesting because before it was if i showed you the first method you were like okay this is cool day but maybe you can run it at microsoft or or google but uh, this is not feasible to do for almost anything else or anywhere else and and even if you could run it would you want to do that right okay but now this is like okay on my small desktop uh, in my lab i can i can run this in half a uh, in half a day or, or two thirds of a day and, and get good results on CIFAR 10 without me doing lots of manual, like, you know, trial and error. So, so now this becomes a little bit more interesting and, and, and useful perhaps, right? So, so the main idea here was that, you know, that step where all the child architectures were sent off to the clusters to get trained in the previous algorithm. Instead of that, what we are going to do is we are going to co-locate on the same GPU architecture samples which share uh, which are very similar to each other and are share a lot of the edges so for example in this uh, for didactic purposes so let's say i have this very small uh, super graph uh, from which samples an architecture has been sampled and the super graph has these six nodes uh, in the graph and let's say the one with the red arrows is one graph right a one subgraph that the rnn sampled and then let's say i sampled another graph which looks 
almost the RNN happened to sample, which looks almost the same. Like it has this red arrow from one to two, two to three, but uh, instead of going from four to five, it goes from three to six, right? What the ENAS then did is said, you know, we are going to put this on the same GPU and we are going to hold the edges which are common between the two architectures. We are going to share the weights between the two graphs, which means that uh, if I do one forward prop I and one back prop, I get to get the gradients across both architectures by doing just one forward prop and one back prop, right? And, and this was the big uh, 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 insight or, or, or the big design change that allowed them to come from something which is wildly impractical to something which looks useful. Hey, Dave? Yeah. Um, is there any relationship between this and Dropout? Dropout. Uh, well, okay, so th there's, there's a little bit of a relationship and, and again, there's no the theory that I can point to here directly. So uh, the thing uh, that I was going to say is that you might find that it is very barbaric, right? So imagine I have two architectures in which one to two is common. This edge is common. I, I am holding that weight constant. Uh, I'm sharing, sorry, I'm sharing that weight between the two architectures, which means that uh, the weight does W doesn't get to, uh, let's say, specialize to either of the architectures, right? It has to, in some way, work for both architectures. Now, you might think that, okay, uh, will this even work? Yeah, it works, and they show that it works in terms of performance. And um, the, the problem, uh, the conjecture is that W has a multitask effect, right? Like W now has to work not just for uh, architecture A, but it also has to work, have reasonable values for architecture B. And, and the hope is that this, uh, that this is still okay to do because of uh, regularization, right? So, so, so it's related, I guess, to dropout in the way that regularization, dropout induces some regularization and, and, and weight sharing here is also giving you uh, some regularization uh, between uh, in the learning process, right? Uh, there actually has been, uh, and I can send you the links afterwards, uh, good uh, insight into how weight sharing helps and hurts in general in neural architecture search. And, and uh, I think we might see a little bit of that later if you get to that. Uh, but hope that answers it for now. Okay, um, so okay, so uh, yeah, and this is just an example of the recurrent cell sampling again, and this is how uh, convolutional uh, cells were sampled, and this is in the cell search space. You can also do, I think they showed macro search space results as well, and uh, just to show you, uh, and I put this figure five from their paper here, that the kind of networks that they, they come up with, right? Like by they meaning the algorithm comes up with is non-trivial. Non-trivial in the sense that, I don't know meaning, uh, about you, but you would have to be pretty weird to come up with networks like this designed by humans, right? Like I wouldn't know what, th this is a pretty weird network and humans tend to generally, I would think prefer symmetry or uh, some kind of like, you know, regularity in patterns. But, uh, so the, for, but this is a cell at least that I wouldn't come up with myself, right? Even if I was trying things by uh, hand. Uh, so uh, let, let's look at this. Uh, ENAS is the efficient neural architecture search. This is the weight sharing paper that I was just talked about. And if you look at, so let's see, uh, this was DanceNet. Oh yeah, so this is GPUs, the number of, G, I think this is number of GPUs they used. Uh, time and this is the number of days for it's a weird way of plotting it but you can see that like you know the previous ones like nasnet was like 450 gpus times four days and 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 I, uh, the original nas paper which we just talked about 2016-17 used 800 gpus for 21 to 28 days this is just like you know i will get kicked out of msr if i started using that much resources uh just for my project um so, uh, but if you have those resources, you can do it. Uh, but now you see ENAS comes down to one GPU for 0.45 days uh, and with very tiny number of parameters. And this is also important to report. They achieved pretty good results, like, you know, better than, <laughs> look at the NAS uh, was getting 4.47% error after this, how many thousand GPU hours is this? 
and now we are down to uh, 16 GPU hours, 2.89 um, or 3.54, right? So um, <clears throat> cut, don't worry about cutout here. It's cutout is just a trick in training procedure, so it doesn't really affect the search algorithm. Um, but it turns out that cutout will give you better uh, accuracies. Um, Okay, so now we, uh, that we have found something which may be useful, let's see, uh, okay, so this is like, you know, some architectures that in the macro search space, again, that is designed uh, completely by the computer. And you can see that again, that this is pretty wonky. I wouldn't come up with this by myself. Um, you may, but if you do, just tell me what you are reading and so that I can become more of an expert. Um, and, and these are, again, in the micro search space, these are cells. So these are just, you remember those patterns? Um, this is a convolution cell and this is a reduction cell. So, okay, so this uh, brings us to the next paper, which is, uh, has actually now taken the uh, world by storm. I am an area chair at this year's ICML and I had 18 papers in my lot, but I can assure you uh, that a lot of the papers, more, like at least 10 to 12 of the papers uh, were built on top of darts, right? So this, this is a paper between CMU and DeepMind uh, called Differential Architecture Search. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is a must uh, cover in at least for a class on uh, neural architecture search. Um, so, uh, Everybody in the machine learning community, at least in the NAS community, started breathing a sigh of relief that we, we, we finally had sense and we were no longer using RL uh, naively in a problem in which we had access to gradient information. There is no, uh, one of the things is uh, uh, many of the methods, and I didn't talk about it, would do like, you know, try to do explicit performance estimation. They would train some networks. Uh, and as the search algorithm trains a few networks, they will try to extrapolate. Uh, you might have seen flavors of this in other classes, uh, other lectures that a big, uh, especially if you have seen learning to search, is that you very quickly get uh, inconsistent, uh, is that your extrapolation errors can grow arbitrarily large. Um, as you are uh, doing this closed loop con uh, uh, control uh, without uh, paying a, uh, attention to how errors uh, will compound, right? Uh, then uh, it, it outperformed at the time, ENAS and PNAS. Uh, it, it, it did show, it had a limitation, at least in the way it was published, that it only showed results on cell-based. Uh, but again, uh, now there are papers which do macro as well. And they showed better error on CIFAR 10 by a little bit, right? Like, you know, 0.06%. And uh, uh, there were other papers by this time, uh, because the moment somebody does something with reinforcement learning, if you want an easy paper, just do the same thing with evolutionary methods. And then you can get a, if you have enough compute, you will get another easy paper out. Right. I, I do not recommend you doing that, by the way. Uh, but so people had come up with evolutionary methods to do the same thing we had uh, seen before. But and uh, obviously, uh, just like our, our RL and whatnot, Darts achieve, does much, much better uh, without uh, that much compute. So, OK, so what, what's, what's the uh, trick here, right? And, 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 and for people, students in this class, this will look very, uh, this will sound very familiar, right? So um, we, uh, let's, let's say I have this particular, uh, let's look at figure eight. Again, this is to, uh, all these figures I have copy pasted from the paper. So all due attribution goes to the paper authors. Uh, so uh, zero, one, two, three, let's say these are some tensors. And uh, this is a tensor, zero is a tensor. And I want to hit it with a particular operator, which is a question mark. I don't know which operator in order to produce tensor one, right? So basically we are asking the question, what operator should I use to uh, process tensor zero in order to produce tensor one? And let's say I have a grab bag of choices. So let's say I have eight operators and eight operators are uh, con three comma three, con five five, separate. Uh, average pools, uh, dilate, uh, uh, max pool, dilated convolution, three comma three five five, right, and and five comma five cross five. So and and then none. So these are the eight things I have, and this is exactly what they used. Um, uh, none because I want to know that should I even be connecting zero to one or not, right? Um, uh, if nobody connects to one, then one won't exist, which is fine. But that can that can all be handled uh, easily. 
So what, what darts would do is it will say, uh, I need to figure out which one, uh, what operators, which of these eight operators to connect, right, at each of these edges. So, and, and let's say for the purposes of illustration, we have only three operators, right, because drawing eight will, uh, will, will become quite uh, complicated. So between zero and one, I have three possible operators. So I'm going to, and these are represented by the different colors, and one and three, so on and so forth. So this is basically my super graph. Uh, so this is another lingo from NAS world, super graph or super net is what you will, you, you will hear. And so I'm going to take this big super graph and I'm going to train this entire thing all by, uh, I'm going to keep around all of these edges in, of the super graph and I'm going to train it completely, right? And so if I'm going to train it completely, uh, the nice part is all possible subgraphs are getting trained just like in ENAS, right? So we have this like this concept of weight sharing, right? Which is being reused here, uh, except what we are going to do, you will see is we are going to get rid of this RL business, right? Uh, and we are going to take uh, advantage of the fact that this is a problem in which we have access to gradients. Uh, so there is no reason for me to do zeroth order optimization when I have first and even second order gradients, right? Um, possibly higher, but you cannot really compute those. Uh, so uh, from zero to one, I have this, uh, I have, sorry, I have all these like, you know, operators lying around in the super graph. I'm going to keep them all and I'm going to train. So one nice advantage is that when I do this forward pass and back prop, I get to see the gradients uh, for everything, right? And I get to update again everything, all the operators and their weights. So like, you know, if I, uh, some operators have weights and some operators don't have weights, right? Like, so average pool, max pool, they don't have any parameters. They are parameterless operations. Uh, whereas conf 3, 3 has parameters, right? So uh, this is something to keep in, keep in mind, will come useful later. So, um, and I'm, and I'm going, uh, going to hand wave the details of the optimization in this slide. But what we are going to do is we are going to put some uh, weights over each of these operator types. So let will be, a, and let's call them alphas. Right? So there is alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four, alpha five, alpha six, so on and so forth. So there are a bunch of alphas. When, and I do some optimization uh, such that I also look at what the values the alphas are taking. Right? And as the, uh, some dominate other alphas, then it means that I have this. Uh, so if you look at figure C, then it, what kind of architecture I should be looking at evolves from this alphas, right? So if you, if you think about it, what we are doing is we are doing a continuous relaxation of a discrete optimization problem. There is a combinatorial discrete optimization problem here, which is actually, right, which is, which is in figure A. What combination of operators should I put here? Operators are discrete things. I have eight choices for each one of them. So there's eight comma eight, eight comma eight times eight times eight times eight uh, uh, possible choices. I can obviously do the naive thing, which is enumerate all of them. This is going to be infeasible. Uh, I don't want to do RL. I want to take advantage of gradient information. And, uh, and so I do, do this discrete to continuous relaxation. I keep all of them around and I put continuous variables, weight, weight variables, alpha on each of them, right? And then if I do some optimization, which I have hand waved and not told you yet, I look at which alphas are starting to dominate. And whichever alphas start to dominate, I'm going to take them and, on, and do this pruning step all the way at the end, uh, where I have kept only the dominant alphas for at each edge, I look at which is the max alpha, and, and I return that particular architecture, right? And so this is my uh, arg close, hopefully it's a good approximator of arg max. I return this to you and say this is the architecture you should prefer. This has very many, many nice things, right? I, do, I, I take advantage of weight sharing, just like the ENAS paper. I don't have any controllers or RL go, going around. I take advantage of the fact that I have access to gradients here. So they paid attention to the structure of the problem. Um, I, uh, and I get to uh, reap the benefits of it by just doing uh, the forward and backward pass in one go. Right, and and seeing like you know what alphas, uh, which means the values of the alphas. Remember, are encoding your architectures. Uh, which of them are being useful? Which of them are not being useful? All at once, and and this buys me a lot of efficiency. 
So, uh, okay, so let's uh, look at, um, actually, yeah, so why is that? I think I'm, can you, okay, so how would you actually go about uh, training the alphas? So one thing is, um, I, and I don't know if, uh, how this will work. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the MAML paper, the model agnostic meta learning paper? I covered it in class. Oh, you uh, you have covered it in class? Uh, very briefly. Uh, and very briefly. In the lecture okay. on um, learned optimization, yeah. Okay, so there's very good news. You don't need to know anything more. This is exactly MAML. So if if you knew, uh, if you remember MAML, uh, uh, you would have come across this term bi-level optimization. So you know if you remember how in MAML there was an outer loop and an inner loop, and the outer loop uh, uh, encoded like you know, uh, hey, what is my uh, parameters that will uh, such that if I optimize this, it will give me an initialization theta, uh, which if I were to optimize on uh, the inner loop task would result in good performance on the downstream task. This is exactly that. This is exactly bi-level optimization applied to neural architecture search. Uh, there is absolutely no difference in the math here. So the alphas are what your outer loop is. The inner loop is what you are when you are doing the training. So just like in uh, MAML, you are asking the question uh, via the, bi uh, the semantics of bi-level optimization. Hey, bi-level optimization, give me an alpha, which is uh, a setting of these alphas, which are the weights, such that if I were to train this, uh, uh, let's say sampled, uh, not, no, sorry, not sampled, the argmax values of alpha, uh, the architecture that it encodes on my downstream uh, task, which is let's say the validation set of uh, or the meta uh, test set uh, in Mammal Lingo, uh, I get good uh, performance. Sorry, the meta training set. Uh, uh, and then because it mimics what will happen at meta test time. So, uh, so, so this is, uh, so now you are seeing that like, you know, how, uh, the, the ideas are the same. This is again a search algorithm, the search problem, uh, but uh, the the basic principles are not that different from uh, cool. what you you are doing. Yeah, cool go question. ahead. Yeah. yeah. So um, one concern, I don't know how much of a concern is that you can get stuck in some pretty weird local optima if you're not doing mm -hmm. any sampling at all. If you're not doing what? Any sampling at all. Oh yes. So. Um, uh, this is very good. So last night uh, I updated, uh, I'm going to skip this for now, uh, uh, the slides to have an entire section called darts problems. Okay, uh, which, which, you can, which, should re which you should read as bi-level optimization problems, really. And, 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 I, and I was wondering if the same problems happen when people do bi-level optimization for supervised learning, RL, imitation learning, etc. I'm going to go and look at some papers uh, today, hopefully. But okay, so uh, one of the problems is, uh, as you all know, bi-level optimization in the most general setting is NP-hard and you are going to get stuck in some uh, local minima. One problem that happens, which is domain specific, uh, and this is uh, just paper that came out at last month's IKEA, is people found that if you train darts too long, like in, uh, so darts had this magic parameter setting of 50, uh, 50 epochs, right? For uh, where 50 epochs for both the outer loop and the inner loop. Uh, and so uh, once it was done, uh, people extended it to 100, 150, and just ran it to see what happens. And they found that very quickly, darts would pick, uh, or bi-level optimization would pick very degenerate uh, cells, right? So skip connect is basically, uh, uh, in darts world, uh, that is identity, right? So just, just think of like, you know, the identity uh, uh, connection, and that's what skip connect encodes. So uh, they found that like, you know, so this is a, uh, cell which doesn't need to exist because it is just a bunch of all of them are identity connections. So, and, and, and yeah, so, uh, this is different search spaces or so forget the details uh, about the search spaces, but, but invariably this, this problem exists. And one of the big reasons they found for this is uh, there's, there's this bi-level optimization approximation step, which is this step, uh, this particular step in step D. 
right? Uh, I, I have this uh, continue, uh, remember we have made this relaxation. So we have gone from the actual discrete combinatorial optimization problem to the continuous uh, uh, approximation. And then we are doing it via this NP hard uh, procedure, uh, NP hard problem. Uh, we are solving it approximately via bi-level. And then we do this hard discretization step, right? So I have all these like continuous values of alpha. And then I'd make this like big, large discretization step. And, and this big yields a big problem uh, when you have, uh, well, there, there are lots of sources of these problems. One problem is that some of these parameters have gradients are, are parameterless, like skip connect, uh, max pool, average pool. They will get, because they don't need to be trained, the gradient values that flows back through them tends to be much higher in average norm, right? Than the ones which are like, you know, uh, con uh, convolution operators and whatnot, separable con, dilated con. So, uh, so there's this discrepancy in the feedback, which, is, which, which here is domain specific. Uh, because uh, they are not uh, similar, but but I guess you could have this in mammal as well. Is if you imagine you had a retinue of, uh, if you had a sampling of tasks where some tasks were easier than others, so mam the bi-level optimization optimizer will get biased to solving the easier tasks faster. So uh, and and I'm and I'm guessing that the same problems would exhibit there. So um, yeah, I'll be curious to find out if somebody has experience with that um, in mammal world as well. But uh, yeah, coming back to here, you will get this skip connect uh, issue problems because the, the uh, problem is that they, they don't have parameters. They will get uh, gradient values which are higher. So the alphas on them will start becoming higher uh, uh, quickly right uh, compared to others so if you if you if you and if you continue training then the alphas on them will start dominating so when you do the discretization step those uh, the alphas corresponding to skip connect are almost always the highest right so various fixes have been proposed like uh, we are going to do operator level uh, dropout uh, then another uh, fix that uh, people have found is so, so this is the problem. Uh, this is the fixes that came out from Frank Hutter's group, where they found that um, uh, when you start in bi-level optimization, um, if you train too long, the validation error at meta test time, right? Remember, you are you are taking the alpha, you are you are testing, you are simulating test time in uh, by uh, creating this like you know uh, validation set on which you do meta test. Uh, sorry, meta training uh, uh, test procedure. You, you, they found that like you know it very quickly overfits to that and gets into minimas which are very sharp and narrow. And this is well known in deep learning that a minima which is sharp and narrow that won't generalize well, right? Because the moment you uh, uh, that discretization step happens, you are going to make a, a big approximation jump. So if you have if you are in a sharp minima with all the alphas present. If you, if you pick only the max alphas, it is probably going to shift you a little bit, which means that your error in the, on the error landscape, you will jump uh, very high, right? So, uh, so this is what is happening is that uh, validation error of search model goes down, uh, but uh, you, the test error of the architecture uh, goes up, right? And, um, and, and they found that this is very highly correlated to the eigenvalue of the Hessian of the alphas, right? So if I take the uh, uh, Hessian matrix and look at its dominant eigenvalue, so this is basically telling you uh, curvature, right? So giving you a proxy for how curved the loss landscape is uh, with respect to your architecture parameters. So alphas are the architecture parameters, uh, not the uh, actual weights of the um, so, so across architectures, if you are in uh, a very bad uh, sharp uh, minima, you are going to get this generalization error when you do that discretization step, right? So a fix uh, that they proposed is to do early stopping, uh, which is a very nice, simple fix, is keep track of your uh, lambda max is the max eigenvalue of your uh, Hessian of your uh, alpha values and keep track of them and as soon as they start uh, going up uh, sharply just stop right and return the uh, architecture 
which was a few epochs before it started going up uh, sharply and then you are done right so so this is this was this is a nice fix uh, many other fixes are coming around um, like uh, you also want to be a node normalize like you know you want to normalize how fast um, one uh, uh, so you see the fact that gradients of uh, certain parameters are higher so you may want to put batch normalization along those nodes individually in order to make sure everybody is on the same scale so that alphas uh, don't dominate because the gradient norms are higher um, so so these kinds of issues are also coming around so right uh, uh isong i don't know if this answers some of your questions or if you have other specific yes, problems it, it does there are is the issues with you know the ill posedness of the landscape due to mm -hmm. the uh, huge disparities in feedback signals causes this kind of local optima sometimes yeah yeah uh, and i would be curious to know if you have other insights uh, or maybe or perhaps offline uh, in, into because I, I'm I, I think like these problems if they are happening so much in NAS probably have been happening in like you know mammal world as well um, so yeah okay uh, okay we are at 10 so I think we, we have 25 minutes okay so uh, one issue that that happens uh, in darts is uh, which should worry you is this keeping of and as well as in ENAS right because this weight sharing business is you might wonder how am I going to keep all this in GPU RAM like remember GPUs don't have lots of uh, memory they have like you know if you buy very expensive GPUs maybe 16 GB 24 GB and if you watched NVIDIA GTC last week they have a 40 GB one a 100 or something which is only in data centers but uh, you know uh, those are expensive and even then this, that's not a lot of ram as compared to cpu right which is very cheap and i can even on a small desktop get 128 gb ram that's not uh, unheard of and i can buy it relatively cheaply so uh, if i have to put all these uh, super network in gpu ram in order to train them in one forward prop and back prop jointly, I'm going to have all these memory issues, right? So how much can I shove into the GPU RAM? This is not, uh, so one uh, solution and, uh, that came out was to do, was to sample through this, this architecture, right? So if you, if you, and you can think of this, uh, there's a nice paper from MSR, uh, 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 New England from Nicolo Fusi's group where they formed this as a Bayesian procedure. So, so obviously like you have probably read like, you know, all the connections between high level optimization and Bayesian optimization. And if you think of like, you know, Hey, I'm sampling from over a prior. So these are my priors. I'm sampling from them and updating my posteriors. Uh, then if you take that particular view, you can sample through those, uh, all these architectures. So that way, when you, you sample and you train only one at a time, uh, that particular sampled architecture, which is going to be much, much smaller than the entire super network, right? So, so if you use these tricks and some gating tricks uh, just to make uh, the, the parameters work, uh, you can uh, uh, get around this memory issues in darts, right? And and you can also like you know uh, the other thing which is you can do this in darts directly uh, but just proxy as did it is if you if you think of as a if you have a, a true pareto multi objective pareto uh, optimization problem where i not only care about the loss uh, cross entropy loss let's say uh, plus i also care about how much latency my final uh, architecture has right and this is uh, really important in production world right so i cannot go to a product group let's say bing or azure and say oh you know that high very uh, high critical like you know uh, business uh, data set you have which is very big and i'm going to give you this very highly accurate model but it is 2 gigabytes big right so they're like no we cannot use this because i cannot do serving in that time right so and and for uh in production like for a search engine or um something which is doing recommendation uh serving time or latency matters a lot right and there's other things that matter a lot like uh, memory footprint of your architectures matters a lot because if my memory footprint is high but latency is low it, uh, high latency is still low I will have to load up many more extra GPUs in order uh, per server in order to uh, service the same number, uh, the same number of uh, queries, 
right? So, so this also becomes adds to my serving cost because a lot of machines will have to be uh, preloaded with my uh, uh, model and ready to go to do queries, right? So I want to shove, uh, have less of these machines so that my Azure bill or my cloud bill is less. Um, okay, so we looked at some DAX problems. Um, uh, th there were some previous versions of this tutorial I gave at some, uh, which, which is on YouTube. And there's the, I think this actually what you are getting is the most up-to-date uh, version. So uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about that. Quick okay. Question. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. So are there any things that people care about that are, that is hard to make differentiable or have a differentiable approximation of? Like, be, like, uh, like communication delay across if it's a decentralized network or like federated learning. I'm just curious, like looking forward, if there are things in this space that are hard to differentiate or make differentiable or have a differential approximation so that you have to do very, very sharp and discrete sampling. Yeah, no. Uh, so for example, uh, one thing which is, uh, well, I haven't thought about it deeply, but one requirement which came about is uh, there's something called GPU utilization ratio. Right, uh, so uh, it has been found that most of the architectures, even if you have like you know low latencies and whatnot, they never reach the total uh, utilization, uh, flops utilization or the T flops utilization that is advertised of GPUs. Uh, so so that so that becomes uh, even if you take like you know ResNet, DanceNet, or or any of these like you know new architectures that are coming out uh, they are uh, they are far they don't utilize the total throughput that is theoretically possible they don't come anywhere close uh, so that's that is going to become uh, also important and uh, yeah one has to figure out if either i can make differentiable or or, or deal with it somehow uh, such that it becomes a part of the optimization landscape uh, other things that I can think of are, let's see. Um, so latency, memory footprint. These you can like, you know, you, you just approximate by just like adding it to the um, uh, objective function. Uh, but I'm not really sure what the approximation gaps are, right? Right. So so general, if I think about like distributed learning, like, you know, people talk about federated learning, like learning on mobile devices, and there's a communication delay that's like, highly variable, much more variable than on a mother, motherboard, for example, that might be hard to um, approximate without sampling. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, I think that is true. And I, I don't know how you would uh, differentiate through that if you're trying to learn a model which has on average or even like, you know, high probability, low communication throughput, uh, uh, low communication latencies. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that's maybe a good just, point. Maybe I'll just jump in with one other thought since, you know, a lot of the people here mm -hmm. at Caltech work on robotics or a lot mm -hmm. of And, you know, thinking about designing learning systems for on robotics is, um, is very challenging for the following reason. If you have an agile robot for a robot, for example, that could fall over like a, like mm -hmm. a segue, um, they typically need to operate at like hundreds of Hertz. Mm -hmm. And so small spikes in latency can kill the controller design. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe perhaps like, you know, what you are uh, alluding to is also the fact that if my neural network is a small prediction module, which is part of like, you know, a big, a bigger system, right? So if, uh, and it's all uh, residing on the same motherboard, same uh, CPU and GPU uh, ecosystem, then something which is slowing down or hogging too many cycles suddenly is going to cause a latency in my prediction, which right. is going to like cascade down and, and right. kill, kill the entire, uh, 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 like, you know, DAG. Yeah. So maybe, maybe another way of thinking about this is I have an entire decision logic system of which, mm -hmm. diff, of which, you know, there's some sort of classical machine learning is a module of, and I can think mm -hmm. about trying to design the entire system to op optimize some accuracy latency trade-off curve. And yes. other logic modules it perhaps could also be searched over. Absolutely. You know, uh, Isong, okay, so th this makes a lot of sense because is this past AAAI, uh, Alec, me, Adit had this paper, uh, a bunch of others on like pipeline optimization, where basically we, we did not, we couldn't figure out any way to differentiate through them. 
Um, I, could, I could talk to you offline about that, but the problem that you're describing, uh, or uh, sorry, the problem that we attack is this like, oh, we have this like big, oftentimes in a company like Microsoft or even in like robotics where you have lots of like ROS nodes running, uh, which are not differentiable, which I can't like, you know, I can't differentiate through a planner module very easily, right? And, 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 and sometimes I only have black box access uh, to these modules and I want to change the configuration of the entire pipeline on the fly to let's say maintain some end latency uh, constraint, accuracy and latency trade-off, right? I have made some SLA with the customer that, hey, my robot has to, where the customer let's say is the robot and it has to, no matter what, the balancing controller has to finish in 10 milliseconds, like no matter what, right? So if su suddenly somebody else are running on the same board takes too much compute, then uh, I got to, I want to have a system that sees that and immediately throttles that down such that my uh, critical loop doesn't slow down, right? Let's say, to give a simple example. But uh, I want to do this in an in a entirely joint optimization manner. And there we could not actually figure out how to make this differentiable, right? Like we, we tried hard, uh, but uh, in the end we did some actor critic like uh, method over uh, factorized over all the modules um, uh, and whatnot. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that's where discrete optimization has to, can really shine, right? Like because you can't differentiate your way through it. Okay. So, okay, so I have, let's see, 15 minutes. So, okay, so I'm going to very quickly give an overview of uh, one paper. So again, this is like, you know, as I showed you that website in the beginning of class, lots and lots of uh, papers coming out. So uh, we had our horse in the race too. Uh, and, uh, and it's already probably getting outdated and uh, we, we need to, uh, there are more, insights and advances that have come out uh, we, that we need to catch up on and release the next version. So one of the things we wanted to do is um, uh, our way of tackling the super graph problem, memory problem was why don't we grow networks from small to big? Instead of taking the entire big chunk and of su uh, the super graph and trying to either sample from it or train it jointly using weight sharing, uh, whether you use bi-level optimization or RL or evolutionary methods, um, what if we were to grow from small to big? Now, the reason we wanted to do this is we also wanted to get out from this business of cell search because uh, lots of papers have shown that there is a lot of human bias that goes in and you will find that if you just randomly uh, search, uh, sample from the cell search search space, you are actually pretty good. In fact, uh, Google, because they have lots of compute, they went and they trained, they took a search space and they trained every possible model on CIFAR 10 uh, of a certain, like, you know, in the darts-like uh, search space, uh, every, uh, in a cell search space, sorry, they, every possible model. So it was around counting, accounting for symmetry. There were 458,000 models. And, uh, and they trained each one, I think, four times uh, to account for variance in stochasticity in the GPU and whatnot and SGD. Uh, so they came up with 1.8 million different models. And so then they could plot the entire landscape. And one of the things that pops out uh, from that uh, uh, exhaustive enumeration, so this is, this is uh, our exhaustive enumeration. And, and if you are at Google, you can do it. Um, you what you is that if you look at the the interesting part is that you could look at the landscape and see that there are large plateaus which means that if you were to throw a dart like you know not, not the darts dart but just throw an arrow and sample one at random with around 12 percent if i remember correctly probability you will land in one of these good nice cost uh, landscape plateaus which means that you will be near very close to optimal 12 percent of the time and, uh, and, and, and similarly, so, which is actually a very high rate if you think about it. So people are like, of course, like, you know, random search is very competitive here because uh, one out of 12 models is near SOTA. So uh, at least in that search space. 
so so why why do we really care about doing fancy bi level optimization and and all this other math that you are dragging me through when i can just do random sampling well the point is that uh, we need to uh, look at search spaces which are also more gener- uh, bigger and and where random sampling uh, is not uh, give you state of the art uh because you want to we are also finding that we are leaving a lot of performance on the table because uh the space of realizable architectures does matter it's just that we have to figure out ways of doing search efficiently through it uh so what, so that was our full like you know uh and we also wanted to get towards lifelong learning uh so that we can continue so often times what what happens in production is unlike uh, our standard benchmarks which we do on academic data sets is that data sets are changing all the time in the sense that imagine you have a recommendation engine and you have a large amount of data for it to begin with you train a model but every day every hour that goes by more and more data is coming in right uh, and and also like certain characteristics of the data set are changing so it's almost like a very fast streaming uh, setting and you don't want to rerun your architecture search method every night on on this big large data set again from scratch right so uh, we are not fully there yet but we also wanted to make steps towards getting towards lifelong learning nas right like an architecture that is just sitting there evolving looking at the streaming data cutting connections adding connections when it needs to adding layers so on and so forth so uh, okay so uh, our uh, one of the things is we, uh, perhaps we were biased because we were doing a lot of research on uh, feature selection or we were familiar with feature selection sub modular optimization etc and gradient boosting so uh, we looked at like what if we just treat this uh, entire nas problem as a feature selection problem right layers are features and activations so we are just uh, and and we know there's rich literature there so what if we like you know just copy pasted methods from feature selection and gradient boosting right so uh on the flight back from new york i found this paper which was the one of the earliest papers if you remember in that list from scott fallman and christian libert from cmu which which is earliest papers on uh, nas right it's called cascade correlation correlation learning architecture so this is an example of doing forward search right so what what happens here and th- and this paper was actually almost type written so the so i i, I don't know how the diagrams were made uh, which is uh, so if you have some inputs you are going to look at uh, what are the uh, hidden uh, there are no hidden units and you have some output layers and and it gets some outputs right uh, and let's say now you think about there are some hidden units and you are going to look at like you know whether i should add another hidden whether i should add another hidden unit uh, such that it will lower my let's say error right like you know and uh, the the conjecture that scott fallman and christian libert worked out of is that if i can somehow have a hidden uh, a shadow unit such that it uh, hangs out on the side but i see that it's uh, it looks at the loss and it and i see and it sees that its error is highly correlated right with uh, sorry it's uh, it uh, its activations are highly correlated with the activations that are going out from the last layer and which means that if there is uh, currently the sorry we, uh, are highly correlated with the gradients going out to the last layer which means that they are correlated with the error signal i can just add this and negate the sign it will lower the error drastically right so this, this is the whole thesis is that i'm going to look for hidden units i'm going to somehow evaluate them without adding them to the architecture which means i'm not going to interrupt the forward flow and backward flow but i'm going to evaluate a large number of candidate layers or neurons which are sitting on the side i haven't told you exactly how to accomplish that yet but if i could the right thing to do is to pick the one which is most correlated with the error signal because the hope is that if i add them with a, a negated sign it will take get rid of the error right so it's almost like residual learning i i can get to lower the error by just looking at uh, what is the most correlated uh, units and add them to the architecture where now they get to affect the flow of gradients um so uh this is a quick overview so start with this phase 0 original model 
uh, we have some of these candidates that lie around. So, the, so you can think of this particular procedure as the modern version of the cascade correlation architecture uh, method utilizing gradient boosting. Uh, so it, it looks at there are some uh, shadow neurons or shadow candidates, you can call them, that lie around. And I evaluate uh, how, uh, co uh, how useful they are. Uh, we have a different metric for evaluating correlation. Uh, and then we, we find the one which is the most useful and we add them to the model. So they, they now get to affect the become part of the model just like regular neurons. And then, uh, and so, the, so that's the or total overview, right? And then the entire process repeats again. Uh, and so you can incrementally keep growing. So in order to do this, we, we utilize some cute tricks, which are uh, to uh, evaluate the shadow neurons. So we have an original model, let's say, and it goes, uh, it's, it's let's say ABC, three layers, regular connections. And I have this candidate model, right? And how do I, make it accumulate gradients information uh, with respect to the loss all the way at the end without actually uh, uh, making it affect the forward flow and the backward flow of gradients, right? So we, if you have taken electrical engineering, you might know Zener diodes. Uh, so the, the, we, we come up with connections which, which look like uh, diode connections. They, they allow electricity to flow in, the, in one direction. They don't allow electricity electrons to flow in the reverse direction, right? So uh, these solid dotted lines are forward uh, is zero, whereas the backward is identity, which means they don't allow forward connections, but they allow gradients to flow through. Uh, and the dotted lines uh, have the reverse of that, right? Forward is identity, backward is zero. And uh, you, uh, back, uh, these are also, you can uh, call it as stop gradient line, stop gradient connections. Um, in uh, deep learning literature, you can just look up. Uh, so uh, the nice part is, hopefully I can convince you that when I'm doing forward uh, propagation on the original model, so I get to go through here. So you, if you see like, you know, forward is identity, the candidate will receive forward activation. The sum, its output will be zero because forward is equal to zero. And so C will never see any difference from the original, like, you know, what we would have sent it anyways. And during backward propagation, I get to, uh, so this is backward is identity. So the gradients will flow through to my candidate neurons and I get to see how the, uh, and I keep updating the candidate neurons weights, um, but the gradients don't flow back here, right? Because the backward is zero. So the gradients don't affect what B and A would have seen which means that uh, I have, uh, I get to evaluate the candidate with respect to the gradient, with respect to the loss, but without affecting what A, B, and C would have seen in, the, in their original state anyways, right? So this is how we accomplish the shadow evaluation procedure. And, and the candidate gets to uh, accumulate like, you know, the gradient with respect to B, and we evaluate many such candidates this way, we pick the candidate which uh, seems the most promising. And once we decide we are going to add the candidate, we uh, scale the input uh, to be uh, the, uh, so that we add it. So initially this is one, so that we, uh, when we add it, we want to add it gently so that we don't disturb the distributions of backward and forward proper, uh, values too much, right? And let by then backprop take over and and slowly merge the candidate in right and this one is set initially to zero uh, so that like you know the initially the flow of gradients is almost the same as it was in the original model and then then back prop will slowly uh, merge the candidate in and these values will change to what they need to be uh, with the optimizer will change them to what they need to be Okay, so uh, so SF is stop forward, SG is uh, stop gradients. This is just now we are using notation. Um, okay, we are almost uh, there, so I will just rush through. And uh, we have lots of uh, operators. So we select which operator uh, to actually add in by, do, by L1 regularizing over them. So we add like, you know, W1 uh, times this plus, so I have some alpha parameters just like in bi-level optimization. But the nice thing is I don't need to do bi-level. I can get away by doing single level here. And I don't, I get around the memory problem by incrementally growing. 
and let the uh, optimized in overall architecture search algorithm decide how big it needs to be, the architecture needs to be. And uh, we get sparsity by obviously L1 uh, putting an L1 uh, regularizer term over the alphas. And uh, the other thing we do is uh, we keep uh, uh, distributed asynchronous queues uh, in order for us to do the Pareto search, right? Like remember, in, 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 uh, you also need to, uh, in most cases, take into account things like latency, flops, memory footprint as well, not just accuracy. So uh, after something gets added in this final queue, it only gets to go back to phase zero only if uh, the uh, number of architect, if certain constraints are satisfied, and the way we decide when the constraint is satisfied is we maintain an approximation of the Pareto frontier of the most cost-efficient model. So let's say on the x-axis we have cost, on the y-axis we have lost, and since we don't know where the Pareto frontier is, we keep an explicit uh, estimate of it, and with some tolerance we sample around the Pareto frontier. Uh, to get models into the queue, right? So the whole assumption is that, for example, this model here, this blue dotted line, whoops, uh, probably a small increment, some addition or uh, subtraction to this particular blue line, blue dot is unlikely to lower the Pareto frontier, right? So under this, uh, you, you don't, uh, so this should never be in the queue. This should not be a candidate. So this way you get to be efficient. You don't have to touch all possible models, uh, which remember is crucial. And then we get to lower, keep lowering the Pareto frontier, right? And uh, I'll show you some results, but the results are not that important. Yes, it gets near state of the art and whatnot, but we have this big crisis uh, uh, in the community on how to, compare and uh, because everybody has different hardware, they have different uh, stochasticity, uh, people use different search spaces, so things can become quite incomparable, but lots of progress is being made via benchmarks on how to uh, uh, bring uh, method to the chaos that is the NAS field right now. Yeah, so in cell search and in macro, in macro search, I think on record, it, it might have changed by now in the three, four months, uh, we were like the best that one could in all the published major works. We scrounged around at least on CIFAR 10. Um, we, we, with, with just 2.2 million parameters, uh, we were reaching 2.83, whereas everything else uh, in macro search, nobody was coming close, at least. Uh, I think that my part primarily also have been driven by the fact that people had just given up on macro, but we showed that, hey, you don't need to give up on macro, you can actually do well on macro. And I think that's making a comeback now, which is good. And on cell, we were competitive. I wouldn't say we were the best, uh, but uh, what, what we are also finding now is that random sampling is quite uh, good. Like if you look at ra uh, 16 random models in the same search space, it gets you 3.32, whereas you do all this fancy optimization and you get to 2.5. So does 0.8% matter? Maybe, uh, but it may not, right? So. I think we need uh, the better benchmarks are also coming up. So where this gap will be much bigger and it come uh, in terms of such space design. Uh, yeah, and we transfer to, we show we transfer to ImageNet. This is pretty standard in NAS literature. You Everybody has to show transfer to ImageNet at least. And in macro, we were pretty good without uh, any domain knowledge injection into the search space. Uh, language modeling, the Pentry Bank, we strongly advocated the community not to use Pentry Bank because random search is actually really good, uh, in, at least on that data set. Is AutoML solved? Uh, far from it. Uh, so there's lots of research that needs to be done. Uh, one of the things I didn't even talk about in this lecture is hyperparameters. Every, in the whole talk, notice I assumed that there is a magic training procedure that is adequate for training any architecture you come up with, but obviously that's not true. Uh, what everybody is doing right now is assuming there's a, a training procedure uh, which has the right hyperparameters, but obviously if you tune the hyperparameters, you will get lots of uh, performance diff. And But the good news is that in, uh, we, lots of like benchmarks in the world where people used to sit and to come up with architectures but manually are falling to architecture search uh, uh, results, right? So this is actually good news in a way because humans can then, we can, I at least find it very frustrating to go around 
tuning architectures by hand and i would just let a computer rather do it right and i think that's the whole point of this class um there's, there's also like you know if, if you're interested in this uh i would highly recommend reading these three papers uh which are coming up with like you know the science of looking into a bit into how do we design search spaces because that is often ignored and as we saw that there's a lot of human domain knowledge injection so what are good search spaces and how do we then scale up our search methods to attack that uh is becoming uh quite a nice uh receiving much more attention now um there's only so much you can do in the dart search space so with that, uh, I have, that's all I have. Uh, sorry, we are five minutes over uh, time limit. We are also going to release this new uh, library, which me and uh, Sheetal Shah, with whom I did AirSim back in the day, um, we are going to release this in June. It will, so that we can have a turnkey solution and a library and it will be PyTorch based. So just a plug, small plug for that. And it will be MIT licensed, so anybody can use it. Uh, it should come out soon. Um, and happy to take any questions online or offline um, and I'm around. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for that very comprehensive survey. I think in the interest of time, we'll probably just uh, close the lecture here, but thank you once again. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to Dave. I think he clearly has a lot of expertise in this area. Thank you again, Dave. Yeah, thank you very much. And it was really fun. Yeah, and feel free to just email me. Yeah, I'm just sitting at home anyways. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Bye.